Thanks. Let's switch to here. Okay. So in, in, in keeping with the theme from yesterday, this is my grandson. So um, first, I, I want to thank the organizers and thank all of you. This is a, a wonderful opportunity uh, for me. I really enjoy engaging with the, the, the people that matter at a university, which is the students. And it's, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to spend a few days with all of you and uh, get to know you and get to know what you're thinking and how you're thinking about the world. So I'm going to talk actually about three different themes, or there are going to be three parts to my talk. The first is going to be um, abstract, and it's really about pedagogy, about learning. And then I get quite concrete, and I'm going to talk specifically about um, this device and, and, and the software that we've developed for this device for learning. And then I'm going to, um, then I'm going to get um, back into the abstract and, and try to draw some lessons from the things that I've been doing over the past 30 years uh, and, and how they might apply to what you do. So, I, but I want to start off and talk a little bit about motivation because uh, to, to a large extent learning is, is coupled to motivation and how we think about motivation impacts how we think about learning and how we think about school. And I actually, I, I was going to wear the mask I made last night because I'm about to engage in a little bit of theater, but I didn't want to startle you, so I decided to do it without the mask. Uh, every day for me is a bad hair day, but uh, uh, nonetheless. So I asked the organizers if they would provide for me a stick. And there's an expression in English, I'm sure there's something similar in, in Korean, uh, around motivation, we motivate with carrots and sticks. We motivate with rewards and punishments. And uh, a, a lot of places, actually, that I still go to, the, the teacher literally has a stick in the front of the classroom. You go to a, to a school in Nigeria, or you go to a school in Pakistan, and there's a stick. There also might be a few carrots scattered around, a few rewards scattered around, but, but primarily school is run with a teacher in front of the class with a stick in hand. And now let's... let's Tear this, tease us apart a little bit and think about what's going on here. Well, first of all, all the Korean students were smart enough to sit outside of the range of the stick. It's just our, our, our guests from overseas that are... Okay. So, I mean, yesterday there was a, a, a you know, they were saying, come down front. Today you know enough to sit in the back because I've got a, a pretty good stick here. Now, I also learned last night that uh, may, maybe in Korea the stick doesn't work very well because the kids are pretty good at... <laughs> but now, again, let's, let's think about what, what the stick is all about. Your job as a student is obviously to avoid the stick. You don't want to get hit by the stick. How do you avoid the stick? Well, the, 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 the basic principle in avoiding the stick is to keep your head down. If you keep your head down, if you're out of sight, out of mind, if you, uh, then, then the stick rarely comes into your life. But now let's think about what does that mean. What does it mean in school to keep your head down? What it means is that you are no longer taking any risks. You don't make mistakes. How do you avoid making mistakes? You don't make mistakes by, by ceasing to take any risks. So what we do with our carrot and stick model of motivation is we teach our students very well how to, be, how to assume the position, how to be very good, not take any intellectual risks. So we're teaching our students with the carrot and stick model exactly how to not be entrepreneurial, how not to be creative, how to, to maintain the status quo. So if, if your goal for school is maintaining the status quo, give all your teachers sticks. 
If your goal for school is to raise a generation of entrepreneurs, of creative people who can solve problems, get rid of the stick. Now it turns out that in the literature, there's, there's very little evidence that carrots and sticks are effective. In the literature, uh, what we've discovered that motivates people is three things. The first is a sense of autonomy. Give people the, the room to be autonomous in their thinking. The second is a sense of mastery. We all get great pleasure from mastering things. And then finally, most important is having a sense of purpose. So if what you're doing is establishing a, a, a classroom or an environment where the students be, can be autonomous, achieve mastery, and have a sense of purpose, you've got motivated students. So get rid of the carrots and sticks. And unfortunately, we live in this world of, of measurement, and measurement is all about carrots and sticks. But let's, let's discard them wherever we can and think about autonomy, mastery, and a sense of purpose as we go forward. Now, when I first started this project with, with some colleagues of mine at MIT, the, the, the One Laptop Per Child project, I went all around the world talking to engineers because this was a big project. We're trying to save the world. And in, in doing so, we were a small team. We needed help. I needed to reach out. So I was talking to engineers, all electrical engineers, mechanical engineers. I was talking to everybody because I needed help on this project. And I went around Korea. Um, I spent actually quite a bit of time in Korea rec recruiting help. And I asked every engineer I encountered, I asked the same question. And to every engineer I talked to, I got the exact same answer to my question. The question was, describe a great learning moment in your life. Not a single engineer said, listening to your lecture. No one answered my question that way. That was never their great learning moment. Their great learning moment, every single one of them said, my great learning moment was solving a problem I was passionate about. And they described autonomy, mastery, a sense of purpose. They described trying all these things, doing these things, making mistakes, talking to this person, consulting that resource, making more mistakes, and finally having some sense of, of, of accomplishment. Every single engineer in every place I went, in every field, described to me the exact same thing. It's universal. They describe great learning, a great learning experience. But then I asked a follow-up question. I asked these same engineers, okay, now you've told me about a great learn learning experience. Let's design a learning invention intervention for school. Let's take that experience and see if we can somehow figure out how to apply it to school. And again, I got, unfortunately this time, I got the exact same answer from every single engineer I spoke to again. Every single engineer I spoke to invented electronic worksheets. Every single engineer I spoke to said, oh, we can put all the curriculum online in, in big classes and run quizzes. Every single teacher I spoke to, every single engineer I spoke to, teachers as well, by the way, um, immediately forgot what they knew about learning and remembered what they thought school was supposed to be. So my lesson is act on what you know, not what you believe. Forget about what you believe school is supposed to be. Act on what you know learning is. Okay. So I want to wind the clock back a little bit and tell you about the origins of the One Laptop Per Child project. Um, I actually came pretty late to the project because I didn't start working on this until the late 1970s. But my colleague Seymour Papert was a, a pioneer in technology and learning. He was studying with Piaget in Geneva back in the, the late 50s, early 1960s. And he had this insight that computation was a thing to think with. I'll say it again, computation is a thing to think with. And so he started, he got some computer time in London, he'd fly to London, get kids in front of the computer, and, and do some experiments in, 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 in the, the, the guise of, of Piaget's 
uh, constructivist theories of, of learning. And then he came to, uh, to, to Boston and um, was working uh, part-time at uh, this company, Bolt, Brannock and Newman. You might have heard of them. They invented the internet. Um, and he also was working at, at MIT. At the, uh, he was a co-founder of the AI lab at MIT with Marvin Minsky. And Seymour and his colleagues uh, invented a programming language called Logo for children. And actually, I'm not, in conversations with a few of you over the last couple of days, I know that some of you were actually logo programmers as kids. And when, when I was a kid, when we used computers in school, we programmed. We used logo. We wrote code. And we used the computer as a thing to think with. Today, thanks to the likes of Mr. Gates and Mr. Jobs, school is about, you know, computers in school is called babysitting. We don't use computers for programming anymore. We use computers for babysitting. And uh, again, I've been to schools all around the world, and I've seen it over and over and over and over again. It's a travesty. It's an absolute travesty. But anyway, it didn't always used to be that way. It used to be that we thought about computation as, as a tool, and we used to think about computation as, as part of the arsenal by which kids would address and solve problems in the world. Um, this is a picture from 19... 82 or 83 in Senegal. The idea of one laptop per child, well, in this case it was a desktop, but one-to-one -one computing in school is not a new idea. It's not an idea of the 90s or, or, the, or the past decade. It's an idea that actually dates back. We were doing it in Senegal in Colombia in the early 1980s. The question arose a few decades later, okay, we've been doing these experiments with kids over and over and over and over again in all these different environments, and they're fabulous, and the kids are loving it, and they're learning, they're doing all this great stuff. The problem is, it's not to scale. How do you bring it to scale? How do you reach every kid, not just a few hundred kids in this school and a few hundred kids in that school? And that was really the incentive behind One Laptop Per Child, was how to take these ideas and bring them to scale. So everything we thought about was in terms of how do you bring it to scale. And so we, we, um, uh, we, we built hardware, we built software, we tried to build a pedagogical model based on Seymour's thinking and, and get it out into the world. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Seymour because he makes a point, uh, uh, he makes a point that this isn't about technology. Technology is just a vehicle for delivering the secret sauce. It's really about culture. It's about changing the culture of school, changing the pedagogy of school, changing the purpose of school. One of my favorite definitions of technology comes from a colleague of mine, Alan Kay. Alan coined the phrase back in the 1970s, personal computer. He was at Xerox in, in, in the heyday of, of uh, all the cool stuff. And uh, Alan's definition of technology, because we, we've heard a lot about technology over the last few days, but nobody's defined it. Alan's definition of technology is anything invented after you were born. And the reason why I like that is because it takes technology down off its pedestal, because technology is just stuff. And the, the thing that matters is, is the, the culture, how we use the stuff. So I'm, 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 over time, I became less and less interested in laptops and more and more interested in the culture in which we embed it. So one of the questions I have, and this, this is a fundamental question to the project, and it's actually a fundamental question to the field. Are we interested in kids learning how to use computers, or are we interested in kids learning how to use computers for learning? And there, there are actually there, there are a lot of pundits out there that stop short of the second goal. There's, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Hole in the Wall project, for example. It was a project uh, done in, in a slum outside of, or I guess a little village outside of Delhi uh, uh, about 15 years ago. And they demonstrated, they put a computer in a hole in a wall in a village, and the kids learned how to use the computer. And that was allegedly some grand insight. Kids can learn how to use computers. Well, we, we know that. Kids, everybody can learn how to use a computer, and it's easier to learn it today than it was 
it, it, you know, back in the, the, the earlier days. But kids can learn how to use computers. What he never demonstrated, and it hasn't even ever occurred to him to ask the question, is are kids learning to learn when they learn to use the computer? Because it's the learning that matters. It's not learning how to use the tool. It's use, learning how to use the tool to learn things, to be a problem solver. That's the open-ended question. And that's the question for which I don't think there's a simple answer yet. Okay. But we actually, with these tools, we have an opportunity to rethink and, and reach a lot farther in terms of what kids are actually doing. Uh, er, Papert's early experiments with Logo literally had, you know, you know first and second graders exploring some of the concepts of calculus. We can reach much further in terms of the kinds of problems that we, we engage children with, with the computer, with computation. And this is a, a, one of my favorite pictures from, this is Thailand, and outside of, uh, in, in the hill country in Thailand. And this is using a computer for learning. This is using a computer as a tool for gathering information, analyzing information. Uh, it, it, this, this is what you want. Um, notice they're not using uh, their, their shiny iPads, because uh, I don't think the iPads like to get dropped in the stream. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, the hardware, and then I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about software, because the hardware, again, is just it's the vehicle. The, the software is the the thing that actually is the interface between the kids and, and the learning opportunities. Uh, when we designed the laptop, uh, we, we fell in love with it. We fell in love with our design. And we were so in love with our design that we didn't want anything to happen to it. So we designed the laptop so that the kids could not put stickers on the laptops. <laughs> my, my colleague in all this is in complete denial now. But it's absolutely the truth. What about this picture? This is, this is my favorite picture of kids with laptops. And it, 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 it's, it's easy to show cute kids with laptops with big smiles, but that doesn't tell you anything about the learning. This picture tells you something, because what do you see on those laptops? You see stickers. Kids want to put stickers on laptops. They had a problem. They solved it. This is, kid, this is a picture of kids problem solving. That's why it's such a, a, a good picture in my mind. Now, the, the other thing is, um, and, 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 and unfortunately, this has become almost uh, um, you know, unique in, in electronics these days. This is not the factory. Um, th this, is, this is what happens in every single school we go to. This happens to be in Kakope, a little town outside of uh, Asuncion in Paraguay. In every single school, because you know, you, if you drop them enough, eventually something might break. So we designed the laptop so the kids could repair it themselves. And in every single school, there's a group of kids who set up shop. You want to you know, fix the laptop, 100 won. And the kids set up their own little repair centers. We designed the machine to be owned by the kids, and the kids take responsibility for it. There was a very, uh, an, an early, project in one-to-one -one computing in the state of Maine in the United States. And they didn't set up any rule in, in Maine about what, the, what happens to the laptops once they're distributed. And there was a bimodal distribution in schools. Half the schools let the kids take the laptops home. Half the schools kept the laptops in carts. And there was a bimodal distribution in terms of laptops that were working and laptops that were broken. The laptops that went home all worked all the time. The laptops that stayed in school were all broken all the time. When you give kids responsibility, they take that responsibility. When you say this is something that's going to be done to you or for you, if learning's not something that's done to you or for you, learning's something you do. Learning is action. Learning is doing. And so we really try to make sure in every case that, that the learning is part of what the kids take real responsibility for. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I want to transition, I think I'm at the right place in my talk, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, software and about the Sugar software, which is a, the, the programming environment that we de developed for the laptop. And um, so I want to, I'm going to sort of jump, in, jump out of my presentation for a second 
And um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a, a little program called Abacus. And Sugar is, is basically two things. It's a platform and, a, uh, and it's a bunch of applications, a bunch of apps or activities that utilize the platform. And I want to show you a, just a few of the apps and describe a little bit of, of the way we think about things because of, because of how we've designed the apps. So this is an Abacus. And actually, I wrote this app. I was visiting my mother one weekend, and I found this book I had as a kid, How to Use the Chinese Abacus. And I said, well, we need an abacus activity for sugar. And you know, he said, well, why do you need an abacus on a computer when you've got a calculator? Well, one thing is I want kids to have multiple representations of the world. Um, my colleague Marvin Minsky once said, you don't understand something until you understand it in more than one way. So the abacus is a way of understanding computation or, or calculation in, in more than one way. And the, you know, the Chinese abacus, I'm, I'm sure that it's, it's, it's quite familiar here. You know, these are ones and tens and hundreds, and these are fives and fifties and five hundreds. Very simple. But it turns out that the Chinese aren't the only ones to invent an abacus. The Romans actually invented the exact same abacus as the Chinese. The abacus is one of these things that's been invented many, many times in many different cultures. As far as I know, calculus has only been invented twice, but the abacus has been invented many times. So one of the things I did in the spirit of giving children multiple representations is I gave them multiple abacus. So this is the, the Japanese abacus, and you can see it's very similar, but it's structured a little bit differently. And this is a, a very common abacus you see, particularly in Latin America, is just a counting frame. Simple abacus like that. So I give them a lot of different representations. And you know, th this is one of my favorites. This is uh, the abacus that the Mayans invented. The Mayan culture in Central America w uh, did their mathematics base 20, not base 10. So their abacus is a base 20 abacus. Makes sense if you're Mayan. Um, now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a nerd, so I gave them a hexadecimal abacus. <laughs> and just to show you the extent of my nerdism, I gave them a binary abacus. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, I already mentioned, I showed you the, the, the repair factory in Kakape. And right after I wrote this, this abacus program, I went to Kakape. And I was meeting with the teachers there. And I said, I've got this great new activity. It's an abacus. Let me show you. And I was all excited. And I showed them the abacus activity. And they said, yeah, that, that's kind of cool. That's OK. But then they said, you know, we're working on teaching the kids about fractions. Is there a way that you could use the abacus for adding and subtracting fractions? So we got talking, the teachers and I. And the teachers of Kakope, you've got to I mean, Kakape is in the middle of nowhere. Paraguay is one of the two landlocked countries in, Latin Ameri in South America. It's in the middle of nowhere. And Kakape is in the middle of nowhere, nowhere. But it, the teachers in Kakape had this idea, and they invented an abacus that's new to the world. It's, I call it the Kakape abacus. This is a Kakape abacus. And the Kakape abacus allows you to add and subtract fractions. A half and a third and a sixth minus a fifth. That's pretty cool. This was invented by the teachers. It's a dirty little secret that nobody in education ever talks about, and that is teachers can learn too. Teachers can learn too. Because you know what? Teachers, just like the rest of us, are human. And being human, we all share three attributes. And these three attributes are what we try to exploit in, in, in sugar. One of them is being human, we're, we're, we're expressive. Being human, we're social. And being human, we're both teachers and learners. So the idea behind sugar is to let the end user take charge and be inventive. The teachers invented this. In sugar activities, you see a lot of, of uh, of gears. And the gear is an invitation to the kids to invent their own representation. So I'm going to actually come to this gear 
and I'm going to invent a new, I'm going to make a new application, a new abacus. I'm going to make an abacus for the Assyrians. The Assyrians um, didn't ever invent an abacus, so we're going to invent one for them. Their math was base 12, so we're going to make a base 12 abacus. All the 12s we have in 12 hours, 60 minutes, all comes from Assyrian mathematics, but they never invented a, an abacus. So let's make this be, and let's just see what this does. And in theory, all right, so we just invented an abacus for the Assyrians. So the idea behind sugar is we don't just give the kids receive wisdom, we let them invent their own things as well. And we do that, if, if, you, if, you, if I come back to the, the main abacus toolbar, you'll notice that I have all these abacus along the top, the, the received wisdom of, of the ages, and the one the kids just invented. It's on the same level. It's not subservient to the other abacus. Because from the mathematical perspective, they're all identical. The kids' invention is just as valid mathematically as any other abacus that's ever been invented. So we give the kids access to ideas, but we also encourage them, give them the tools to allow them to be expressive with those ideas. And we take it a step further, because sugar is free software. I don't, know in, I don't know any Korean, so I don't know whether the term, how the term free software translates into Korean. It's a really bad term in English. It's much better in Spanish. In Spanish, it's called software libre. Free software, and, and, uh, and actually, I'm, I'm, I was a little shocked at how little free software I've seen since I've been here in KAIST. But free software is not about free as in price, although typically it's available for free. It's about freedom. It's about having the freedom to look at the software, that's called open source, but also to modify the software, to take it and own it and make it your own. And so Sugar is software Libra because you could draw a line in the sand and say there are, only, there are two things that unequivocally are on the free software side of the land, of the line. One of them is voting machines and the other is educational software. They have to be free, they have to be open. So we, we did that quite explicitly and one of the things with every single sugar activity, we have this concept called view source. This is one mouse click away is the source code of the program I was just running. Every single sugar program has a source code available one mouse click away. And not only do we give them the, 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 the source to the program, we also give them the source to sugar. And once I have that program, I can hit duplicate. And once I hit duplicate, I have my own copy of the program. Because remember earlier I was talking about keeping your head down, not making mistakes, because that's risky and we don't want risk taking. Well, in sugar, we want risk taking. So I want to take the risk out of modifying code. If I modify code and make a mistake and break something, my teacher's going to be angry at me. But if I modify code and break it and it's my copy, and the copy that my teacher gave me is still pristine, I take a lot of the risk away. So in Sugar, now that I've, I've duplicated that, I have an, another copy right here. That's my copy of Abacus that I can go and mess around with and break. See the, the little gear on there again. So the idea behind Sugar is to make it be really easy for our end users to take the code and modify it and change it and have that be part of the learning process. Um, now I'm going to go and do, um, actually I'm going to just check something for a second. I want to hopefully, uh, Okay, I'm running a little low on time here, but let me, uh, let me accelerate. Um, we're going to do a little programming. Because the other thing I, I really want kids to do is I really think that I don't want every kid to be a computer scientist, but I want every kid to understand programming because it's a powerful way of thinking about the world. And it's a great, safe place to debug, to problem solve, to make mistakes and, and not hurt anything. So, how many of you have ever used a paint program on the computer? Come on, everybody's used a paint program. Get those hands. I know it's early. Everybody's used a paint program at some point. All right. How many of you have ever written a paint program? Not so many. OK. Let's write a paint program. Because it turns out there's nothing mysterious about paint. Adobe likes to make you think there's something mysterious there, but there's nothing mysterious there. All right. So, oh, you know, darn. I went to the trouble of making sure that Everything was in Korean, and I was going to do my whole demo in Korean, and I forgot to switch to Korean. 
So I'll show you after, but this is all, this is all actually all in Korean too. I apologize, I forgot to do that. Um, so if we're going to paint, we need to know whether the mouse button's down, right? And actually, just to make it easier to see what's going on in the back of the room, those of you who want to avoid the stick, I'll, I'll still make it so you can see what's going on. Okay. So I have, I have a button. Is, is a mouse button pushed? And I also need to know where the mouse is if I'm going to paint. Almost done. So um, if the mouse button's pushed, then we want to put our pen down because we're going to draw. And if the mouse button's not pushed, we pick our pen up. Make sense? And then we want to set our x, y position to wherever the mouse is because the turtle has got the pen. And we want to do this forever. So we just wrote paint. That's paint. Let's just see if it works. Looks a bit like my mask from last night. <laughs> okay. That's paint. Paint is that simple. So if Adobe tries to tell you paint's complicated, it isn't. Now here's the thing. We just wrote paint. Therefore, we own it. When we own it, we're responsible for it. And this is where the magic comes in. Because we're responsible for paint, we have to make paint cool. This is not cool. This is a boring paint. How do we make paint cool? That becomes our responsibility. So let's make paint cool. So um, what I'm going to do is come back to my sensor palette and we'll grab loudness. And we'll grab pen size. And just from experience, I'm going to do this. Let's see, say 50. And I'm just going to drop this in here. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm going to um, change the, the size of my pen as I draw based on the loudness, the volume my microphone's picking up. So let's see what that does. You know, let me uh, change this. That's, let's make this be uh, 100. <laughs> oh, so you get the idea. Now all of a sudden we've got cool paint. So by, by demystifying, by opening it up, by making it free, by giving the kids the tools to explore and make things, um, they, 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 they do. And so with, with Sugar actually, with, with this turtle program, my goal is actually to have the kids write every single Sugar activity in turtle. Uh, you don't actually need anything more than this. They can, you know, so you can write a, 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 an interactive chat, you can write a webcam, you can write anything with just a few blocks in turtle art. In fact, so last night, we were, uh, we were playing a game last night, and I kind of liked it. And so I, I, I sort of half said to myself, I should go to bed, but instead I wrote this game in turtle art, and you might recognize it. There it is. Okay. That's that. That's it. That's the whole game. It's just it's it, it's all there. It's all accessible. So the idea is to sort of encourage the kids to really in, engage in that way. Now, there there's two other things that I don't really have time to go into, but I'm just going to mention them briefly in passing. Okay. A lot of what sugar is about is to encourage the kids to make things, to do things, to build things, and have everything be transparent and open so they can see how the world works, so they can master things, and they can um, have autonomy around how they do things. But there's something else that's also important. There are actually two other things that are important to learning, um, both of which we take into, into account in sugar. One thing is that learning is not something you do just by yourself. Learning is not a solitary activity. Learning is actually a social activity and should be a social activity. And ironically, there's only one time in life where collaboration is called cheating, and that's when you're in school. In the rest of life, collaboration is called being smart and getting the job done. So another thing we do in Sugar is we make collaboration be one mouse click away. 
We do a lot with peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, infrastructure-free collaboration. So you don't need the internet to collaborate. You don't need the internet to do peer-to-peer -peer editing. You just do it laptop to laptop. So I can, I can ask you to look at my, my document, one mouse click, we're collaborating. So we don't have to go make a connection to the internet, go to Google Docs, upload our document, send an invitation, open our Gmail, get the invitation, click on it. Five or six steps later, we're collaborating through an enormous amount of infrastructure that's completely outside of the realm of possibility for most kids. But instead, under a tree, laptop to laptop, one mouse click, we're doing it. And that extends across sugar the entire platform. The other thing about learning is learning's not just doing, learning's also reflection. We have to reflect on what we've learned. And so there's actually a great book out of Harvard School of uh, Education called Studio Thinking. We take a lot of, 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 of what you consider the artist studio as a model for how to think about learning. And it's actually similar to what happens in engineering environments as well. So you don't just do things, you also stop and reflect on what you've done. And we've got this concept in sugar called the journal or the diary. And in the journal, you have uh, a, um, a, a record of everything you've done and a place to write notes. It's your lab notebook. Um, you know, yesterday we heard that uh, it was 200 years ago that, that one of the threshold events, I actually think the threshold event was the Enlightenment, which was a little bit earlier than 200 years ago. But the idea of the lab notebook is an idea from the Enlightenment, good idea. We give the kids this place to reflect. But we don't just stop there, we also have the kids um, we, we have this uh, concept of portfolio where the kids uh, collect their best work. It's a record not of what they know, but what they can do. It's a different approach to assessment, actually quite popular in some countries. And, and the kids present their portfolio to the other kids. The other kids can comment on their work. The teacher can comment on the work. And so when I was a kid, I'd come home from school and the, my parents would ask me the question, what did you do in school today? And it took my parents, my parents were a little slow, it took them about a week to figure out that I was never going to answer the question. And so they kept on asking it for about a week, and it was always nothing, nothing. I didn't do anything in school today. In sugar, the parents just say, let me see your portfolio. And then they see what, what, what the kids are working on. Um, so those are things that I'm, I'm not going to really have time to go into. I do want to share with you a little bit of work on assessment. Um, this is some work from Uruguay. And in Uruguay, when we went to Montevideo, we had the opportunity, oh, I'm really running out of time. We had some opportunity for um, uh, looking at the before and after, what kids did with computers before sugar, what kids did with computers after sugar. Before sugar, what did kids do with computers? They did what kids everywhere do with computers, they played games. After sugar, what did kids do with computers? They played games. But they also, um, searched for information, they wrote, they drew and painted, they made videos, they chatted, they um, uh, uploaded things, they downloaded things, they used electronic mail, they blogged. So they used the computer as a tool, not just as a game. And th so they used the computer as a thing to think with. Now, w whether this impacts their, you know, their, their PISA exam scores or not is irrelevant. It impacts their ability to engage in real problem solving in real life, and that's, that's what we're after. This is my favorite statistic from Sugar. Sugar has got an app store. Everything in our app store is free. It's different from the Apple store and the Google store in that it's a couple of orders of magnitude smaller, and it, but it's also different because everything in it is free and everything in it is sort of geared towards learning. But the other thing about it that's different is this number. 10% of our apps were written by kids by sugar users. And when I say kids, I'm talking about our apps are written by 12-year-olds. 30% of our apps are maintained by 12-year-olds. So sh the sugar environment is actually, you know, really owned by the kids. They've taken responsibility, it's theirs. And that's exactly what we set out to do right from the very beginning. I've got a 15-year-old on my board, brilliant programmer. It used to be that, you know, the kids would send me patches, now, then it was, I'm sending them patches now, they don't accept my patches, they're not good enough. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I only have a few minutes left and I want to quickly run through, remember I said I was going to go from the, the abstract to the concrete and back to the abstract. And I want to take some, uh, you know, one, my, in a previous life, life I was the director of a lab at MIT, the Media Lab, 
And a lot of times people say, well, what's the secret of the Media Lab? Well, there actually, it turns out there are seven secrets to the Media Lab, and I want to quickly share them with you and, and, and draw analogies between the way I used to run the lab and think about learning at, at a university laboratory, and it's actually completely analogous to the way I think about learning with kids. I, I think that in, in both cases, it's the same set of principles. So the, the first secret is, is represented by the sun, and that is that there aren't any secrets. Everything's done in the open. We don't have anything proprietary in the lab, or we didn't, at least when I was running that. I think it's changed since. Everything was in the open so the ideas could flow. So I could see what you were working on and it would influence what I was working on. Um, second secret is, is the moon, which represents uh, the, the, the cycle, the process. Th that um, there's this, this constant flow of imagine and realize so to make things, and then critique and reflect. And you're constantly cycling back between these two. Imagine and realize, critique and reflect. And that was the imperative. I didn't tell the students or my, my colleagues that when I was director, I didn't direct them. I didn't say, do this, do that. But I said, you've got to do this. You've got to operate based on this process. And it's the same process that the kids with sugar use. Um, I've already alluded to this earlier. You know, Fire. Love is a better master than duty. If you're working on things you love, you're, you're going to master them, you're going to feel a sense of purpose, and there's going to be more learning that happens. Um, so you, you, you don't invest in projects, you invest in people uh, and, the, and the fire in their belly. Uh, water, well, water really is, is about change. The, 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 the Heraclides is the one who observed that you, know, the, you, know, you can never step into the same river twice. There's, there's always change. And you need to learn that change is part of life and learn to accept change and work with change. And, and uh, um, it's, it's just one of these fundamental principles of life that I think not, not enough people uh, consider. Um, wood. This is one of my favorites. Um, when we think about design and engineering, we, we, oftentimes we think about engineering as, as the, 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 the trunk of the tree that holds the tree up and the design is the bark, the surface, what it looks like. But in fact, that's a really poor model, a poor approach to design and engineering. It's, much, it's, it's wood, but it's wood grain. Design and engineering are interlocked like wood, wood grain. And there's this concept that, that's all over the world, I see it everywhere, called STEM. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And every school system in the world is trying to get more science, technology, engineering, and mathematics into the program. Because science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is the future. Well, there, there are a couple of problems with that. Okay? One problem with that is there, we haven't figured out, unless there's part of the, the, the show and tell this afternoon, somebody's got a time machine. Um, but I don't think we've figured out anywhere how to put more than 24 hours in a day. So if we add more time spent on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, we have to take time away from something else. And typically what goes out the door is the arts. Because who needs the arts? Well, if you stop and think about it for a second, the arts is the only time in school you're doing open-ended problem solving. Open-ended problem solving is congruent with the arts. And so we throw away the open-ended problem solving to have more science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And if it was true science, it would be open-ended problem solving. But that's not how we approach science in school. So uh, I, I've been blogging about this for a number of years now. And my colleague, John Maeda uh, at, at RISD, has been blogging about it uh, quite recently. Um, they, they, they're spelling it wrong. They left out the A. We want the world to be steam-powered. The A is the arts. So if you, you, you can't leave the arts out. And uh, actually, one of the, the, it was thrilling last night to see the students expressing themselves uh, with, with the arts. Gold, point of view. Point of view is worth a lot. Get out into the world, see what's going on, get perspective on, on what you're doing. Talk to people, collaborate, get point of view. It's powerful. Um, and then finally, you want to ground your problems, you want to ground your work in the real problems. Uh, because if, if, otherwise, you, you tend to, to drift off and, 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 and do a lot of nonsense. Um, and I, I, this is an analogy from a colleague of mine, David Reed. 
he talks about water and ice. Water is fluid. Ideation is fluid. But then there's a phase transition into ice. Ice is solved. That's, industry is about ice. Academia is about water. And you need to have this, this, this nice bridge. You should be fluid while your students take risks, do things, get out there. Uh, when, when you're in industry, then, then you, you solidify things. Um, okay, I, I want to say thank you. I think I'm just about out of time, at least according. This is my clock, this one. <laughs> That's my slide counter. Um, I, I just a couple of, couple of things. Um, I, I have a hidden agenda for coming here, and that is in October we're going to have Turtle Art Day, International Turtle Art Day, and I'd love to get some, some kids work with some kids here in Korea around programming and turtle art. And so anybody who's interested maybe in working with local elementary school, um, come talk to me after, because I think we could do some fun things with the kids. Um, I have a book to plug as well. This is a, a, a book that I just wrote about the laptop project. You've heard the expression, learn from the mistakes of others. Have you ever met other? I'm other. I made all the mistakes. That's, that's what this book's about. It's a book about mistakes. Um, and I'll finally, you know, again, in, in the spirit of showing off our grandchildren, um, <laughs> and the, the thing, I, this is, uh, he's, a, he's a drummer as well, and uh, I really enjoyed the drum music last night. And again, what he's doing is, you know, there's an expression, if you've got a hammer, the, the, all the world's a nail. You know, for him, all the world's a drum, and he'll take whatever he can find and, uh, and, and, and pound away. With that, I want to say thank you, and I don't know, do we have time for questions, or? See, okay, good. Thanks very much.